Today, we are going to conclude our journey with Joel. We have been on a three-part journey with Joel, and so today we're going to look at the end of Joel 2, all the way through the end of Joel 3. And if you remember, we've had some downs on this journey, we've had some transition on this journey, and today, what I want to talk to you about in this last part of the journey is a future hope. Now, when I say future hope, sometimes the hope that we see and that we look forward to is a real tangible thing. It's, it's right out in front of us, it's coming tomorrow, it's got a set date, we know what it's going to look like, and we can step into it really comfortably. And then there's times that we have hope that's way out there. Not even sure when it's going to show up. We know it's out there somewhere, but it is way out there. And God's good for it, but it is out there. And we have to live into it, reach for it, and go after it. And I think that's a little bit of the hope we get introduced to here at the end of Joel, it's a hope that is out there, it's a hope that is promised, it's a hope that culminates in the New Testament and will culminate when Jesus returns, but it is out there and we should live towards it and we can actually find ourselves looking forward to it even though it's a little bit out there. Now, before we get into the text itself, I want to share an illustration of how this kind of hits me and I think it fits on this National Take a Hike Day. When I go on hikes, we have any other hikers in here? Very good. We're in Oregon. I would hope like all the hands are up, right? So when I go out on hikes, um, I may or may not be the most responsible hiker. So when I go out, all I want to know is just a couple of things. I want to know where it starts, and I want to know how long it is. And that's about it. In an age where we have all the technology, right? We got topographical maps, we got trail maps of stuff all over the world. I don't look at that at all. I don't go online and read the blogs of all the people who have done that hike and what their dog did on the hike. I don't look at all the pictures of the hike because I don't want to ruin it. I kind of like the surprise. And for me, all I need to know is how far am I walking? Because for me, I've got usually a watch got a GPS on it. I know roughly how long I can walk in a certain period of time. And so I just need to know, is it two miles, is it three miles, is it longer? And I'm good. And then when the hike comes and the twists and the turns come, I can be excited about it. And it's a surprise and it's new. And all I got to know is how far am I going? And generally, when am I going to be done? Now, can that get you into trouble? Yes. And we will close out the sermon with an example of that happening. But what gives me comfort is the fact that I know where this thing ends. And I want to give you guys an example. How many of you guys know which mountain this is? If you know where this mountain is, call it out. I'll give you a hint in a minute. Sisters, no. No, not three fingers. It, it does have the three. I'll give you a hint. This is the tallest mountain in the lower 48. Klamath Falls. Klamath Falls. It is not Klamath Falls. <laughs> this is Mount Whitney. This is Mount Whitney. This is my favorite hike on earth. Now take a look at this picture. Raise your hand if you see the hiking trail. <laughs> Can't really see it, right? You think it's that? Yeah, it's actually not that at all. Um, what's fascinating about hikes like this, this is 11 miles up and 11 miles down. What's fascinating about hikes like this is especially this one you look at, you cannot see the trail at all. In fact, the trail goes around here along the back of this, up, 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 up to the tippy top. And when I first did this hike, I've done it a couple of times, I literally didn't have a clue what I was going to see during that 11 miles up and 11 miles down. I just knew how long it was and did it twice. Now, fortunately, I did this with other people and we made it, but knowing that distance was all it took for me. And it made this one of the most beautiful hikes I've ever done because I didn't really realize the things I would see along the way. I just knew there would be a top and it would finish. And I was hoping to do it in one day. And so for me, it allowed me to keep going because I knew I got a couple miles left and I will be done. I think life has got some of that in it. There's some stuff out there and we can't see it necessarily. We don't know exactly when it's going to play out, maybe exactly how it's going to play out, but it's out there. There is hope out there for us. God has a plan. He says he has a plan for us and it's a plan that's good and we want it tomorrow. 
but it doesn't always happen that way. But what helps me to keep going on this hike that is life is just knowing it's out there. And I think that's a little bit of the hope that Joel lays out at the end of this prophetic book. Now, just as a reminder of where we've gone and where we're going, okay? So we've moved away from lament. That was the first chapter. We talked about the importance of laments and, and mourning and grief. And then we moved right on out of that, right? Out of blue and into yellow and where the changing of the heart and the changing of the heart and the changing of the mind generates outside and that changes our behavior. And once we go through that, we can live into a future with hope. A future with hope about God, a future with hope about who we are because we've changed, a future with hope about other people. Something out there, a light that's out there that we get to move into. Let's take a look at Joel 2, 28 and 29. Then afterward, I will pour out my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams and your young men shall see visions. Even on the male and female slaves, in those days, I will pour out my spirit. This is a beautiful, beautiful picture. Remember where we are? We're in the Old Testament. We're in this prophetic book, and God is coming. He's saying, there's going to be a day that everybody is going to be a prophet. Everybody is going to have their spirit as their guide. On that trail, on that hike... There is one who goes before us, it is the Spirit. There's one who goes with us, it's the Spirit. There's one that goes behind us to keep us going, that's the Spirit. And here's Joel, a prophetic messenger, that says there's going to come a day that everybody gets to have access to this. It's a beautiful, beautiful picture. And as I, as I picture this, as I picture the Spirit, that one that's ahead of me as a guide on the trail, I think about that trail itself is this incredible book, right? This trail that we're walking. We're not walking for the first time. Someone's already blazed that trail, right? God, people before us, millions of them have come before us, followed Jesus, and they've already walked this trail. And all we got to do is read this book to know where to go. And we've got the Spirit to walk alongside us and guide us into this future with great hope. But I don't want you to miss what he says here about the Spirit coming for all people. Because remember, when this was written and where this fits in the Bible, you've got a lot of people that used to think that the Spirit only showed up for a couple. The Spirit was there for just a select few. And he's saying, oh, no, 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 no. This is a Spirit that's coming for everybody, right? This is a Spirit that we see fulfilled when you see it in Acts. You see this come at the end of time. Like, this is a Spirit that is there for absolutely everyone. And it's a fulfillment of beautiful, beautiful words by Moses all the way back in Numbers 11:29, when Moses said, would that all the Lord's people were prophets and that the Lord would put his spirit on them. And so think about this. You've got Moses, who is a prophet amongst a whole number of other things, a leader and a guide and a ruler, right? But he's a prophet. He says, wouldn't it be cool if everybody was a prophet? How humble is that? He doesn't need to be the guy that's always relaying the message from God. He's like, wouldn't it be great if God could literally speak to and through each and every one of us? And so when Joel, Joel says, yeah, that's going to happen. The Spirit is going to be a guide for every single one of us and allow us to be prophets, which is simply God sending a message, a word, and us sharing that with someone else. We don't do anything. Right? We're just conduits. That's a prophet's job. God's got a message. You hear it, and you pass it on. And Joel says that is going to happen. Let's look at uh, 230 to 38. I will show portents in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and columns of smoke. The sun shall be turned to darkness and the moon to blood before the great and terrible day of the Lord comes. Then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be those who escape as the Lord has said, and among the survivors shall be those whom the Lord calls. For then, in those days, and at that time, when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem, I'll gather all the nations and bring them down to the valley of Jehoshaphat. And I will enter into judgment with them there on account of my people and my heritage Israel, because they have scattered them among the nations. 
They've divided my land and cast lots for my people and traded boys for prostitutes and sold girls for wine and drunk it down. What are you to me, O Tyre and Sidon and all the regions of Philistia? Are you paying me back for something? If you're paying me back, I will turn your deeds back upon your own heads swiftly and speedily. If you've taken my silver and my gold and have carried my rich treasures into your temples. You've sold the people of Judah and Jerusalem to the Greeks, removing them far from their own border. But now I will rouse them to leave the places to which you have sold them, and I will turn your deeds back upon your own heads. I'll sell your sons and your daughters into the hand of the people of Judah, and they will sell them to the Sabaeans, to a nation far away, for the Lord has spoken. And at this point, you might be wondering why I have called this future hope. Sometimes in life, things have to get worse before they get better. And I think that's a little bit what's going on. Remember, Joel 3 is not done. This, this book is not done. This message is not done. But sometimes that hope that's out there, this is the one we, we can't quite see. It's not quite on the calendar yet. It's just out there. Sometimes things have to get more challenging and there has to be a little bit of a struggle before we get to that light at the other end of the tunnel. But the good news is it may get worse before it gets better, but it will get better. There is good news at the end of this journey. And Joel wants us to see that, but he also wants to know what's going on with these people. And he wants us to know that God is most certainly on it. One thing you should know about this battle that he describes, Jesus himself talks about a very similar battle in Mark 13. Jesus said, But in those days after that suffering, the sun will be darkened and the moon will not give its light and the stars will be falling from heaven and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Then they will see the Son of Man coming in clouds with great power and glory. So Joel talks about it. Jesus talks about it. If you want to really look into this, take a look at the book of Revelation, which is where we finished out last year, right? And it talks about this final battle when God is going to set the world right. And we get to look to that with hope, knowing that that is somewhere out there in the future, even if we can't quite see the top. We can't quite see the end. But the reason I like this is I love that we have a God of notice. In other words, the God of the heads up. Think about this. When God created everything, he didn't make Adam and Eve and, and put them in the garden and said, let's see what happens. Let's see what they eat and what they don't eat. He didn't let them loose and they went to that one tree, right? The tree of knowledge of good and evil and just take the fruit and all of a sudden lose eternal life. And he's like, oh, I probably should have told them. That's not our God. He's more loving than that. He gave them a heads up. That's who he is. He's given us his word. He says, this is my word for you. I want you to live your life like this. This is my notice to you, right? We don't think about this. We go out in the world today and we're constantly surrounded by notice. You drive on this street and there's notices posted of how fast you should go. Do you know who originated this idea of notice and law? God, the God of the heads up. The God who said, this is what's coming. There's going to be some challenges maybe, but at the end, there's a light and there's a hope and it is good and I am on it and I'm going to take care of you. And then there's this beautiful statement in verse 32 in the Old Testament. It says, then everyone who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. In the Old Testament, everyone who calls on the name of our God will be saved. Can't earn it, can't do it, can't follow a certain number of steps and make it to the goal on your own. Everybody who calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved, even though there's going to be some times that things are going to be challenging. And then there's a beautiful statement. Remember last week we talked about God making that statement that he's going to pay them back for what they had lost? All the stuff that those nasty locusts, right, had eaten? And here you see it again at the beginning of chapter 3. Joel says he relays this message. For then in those days and at that time when I restore the fortunes of Judah and Jerusalem. I believe, and I hope you believe, in a God of restoration. A God who says, I'm going to fix all of this. A God who knew full well what he was doing when he dropped Adam and Eve in the garden and gave him the rules. 
and knew that they weren't going to follow him. And Jesus was never a plan B. He says, I'm going to come and I'm going to fix this. I'm going to show you how much I love you. I'm going to show you how to live this life. And at some point, he's coming back and I'm going to put all this together. New heaven, new earth, new Jerusalem, right? He's going to fix all of this. And it's not just in Joel we see this. The New Testament talks about it. It says, repent therefore in Acts. Repent therefore and turn to God so that your sins may be wiped out. So that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. And that he may send the Messiah appointed for you. That is, Jesus, who must remain in heaven until the time of universal restoration. That God announced long ago through his holy prophets. Just like the prophet Joel or Yoel. There's going to come a point in time. Jesus is showing up and he is going to restore all of this. Just the way God planned it from the beginning. 1 Peter 5.10 gives us another glimpse of this. The God of restoration. And after you've suffered for a little while, the God of all grace, who's called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, support, strengthen, and establish you. And I don't know about you, there's times I look at verses like this and I wish I could just get rid of that first phrase. Why do I have to suffer for a little while? What's that all about? Why do we have a struggle? What is that all about? Unfortunately, there's other parts of the Bible that tell us that that struggling and those trials are for our good to strengthen us and to make us stronger and to look more like the Lord. But don't forget, he also says on the other side of that, there's a God of all grace that knows that we're going through a struggle and he's going to come back and he's going to put this whole thing together. And here in Peter, he's going to support us. He's going to strengthen us. And he's going to establish us, make us unmovable, eternal, if we believe in Christ Jesus. And as I think about this, one of the reasons I love this particular image, when we think about the end of time, remember we talked about this, I think it was last week or the week before, that the Bible says there's going to be a come point in time that you're going to go before God and give an account. Right? Romans talks about this account of everything we've done. But when you look and you find images of this end of time, there's like a lot of really scary stuff out there. Like just one person before a big God and they're just on trial. The reason I love this image, it gives this picture of Jesus Christ right there alongside us. They're reminding, just in case, because God, of course, never forgot, I went to that cross for him. I went to that cross for her. And so, yeah, we can talk about all those things that they did, but all the sins are covered on the cross. I'm their advocate. I love them. All, however many billions of us there are. We're not alone. Jesus Christ has already covered that. And now we know that we've got the Spirit with us as we walk and head towards that moment. Now, there's another reason I like this idea of a God of restoration. How many of you have siblings? Okay, fair number of us. How many of you have said or heard the phrase, ooh, I'm telling, <laughs> right? Like we get into these, these fights or these arguments or our sibling or maybe me would do something wrong. And when you're kids and you can't fix it, maybe because they're bigger, they're older, or whatever's going on, you can't fix it. And so someone will say something like, ooh, I'm telling. And it means something. You're like, no. Because if you tell there's a parent, there's someone who's going to fix it, and that's a problem, right? Now, when we grow up, we don't necessarily have that same system, and there's a reason for that. And the good news for all of us is we don't have to say this to God. When we grow up and we become adults and someone hurts us, we don't have to look at them and say, ooh, I'm telling God. You know why? Bingo, he knows. He knows he's seen the whole deal. He's got like the best security cameras in the world. He can see all of it. And we don't have to say that. We don't have to threaten. We don't say, I'm telling anybody. God knows. And at some point, all of us, including us, are going to stand before him and, and give an account. And he's going to be the one who's going to come down here. He's going to fix it. And he's going to restore it. And yeah, Jesus died for that person too. Let's uh, close out Joel 3 with 9 through 21. Proclaim this among the nations. Prepare war. Stir up the warriors. Let all the soldiers draw near. Let them come up. Beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. 
Let the weakling say, I am a warrior. Come quickly, all you nations, all around, gather yourselves there. Bring down your warriors, O Lord. Let the nations rouse themselves and come up to the valley of Jehoshaphat, for there I will sit to judge all the neighboring nations. Put in the sickle, for the harvest is ripe. Go in, tread, for the winepress is full. The vats overflow, for their wickedness is great. Multitudes, multitudes in the valley of decision. For the day of the Lord is near in the valley of decision. The sun and the moon are darkened and the stars withdraw their shining. The Lord roars from Zion and utters his voice from Jerusalem. And the heavens and the earth shake. But the Lord is a refuge for his people, a stronghold for the people of Israel. So you shall know that I, the Lord your God, dwell in Zion, my holy mountain, and Jerusalem shall be holy, and strangers shall never again pass through it. In that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. A fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord, and water the wadi shittim. Egypt shall become a desolation, and Edom a desolate wilderness, because of the violence done to the people of Judah, in whose land they have shed innocent blood. But Judah shall be inhabited forever, and Jerusalem to all generations. I will avenge their blood, and I will not clear the guilty, for the Lord dwells in Zion." Joel closes with this picture of God on the mountain. I almost picture here God on the throne. He says, I'm going to take care of all of this. Now, when we read through this first section, you might have heard something kind of familiar in verse 10, but something a little bit different. And take a look at this again. Joel says, beat your plowshares into swords and your pruning hooks into spears. Let the weakling say, I am a warrior. Now, you might have heard something that sounds a little bit like this, but completely the opposite. Not where the plowshares are turned into swords, but the swords are turned into plowshares. This is the one that's usually shared and encouraged and posted and put up onto walls, and this is from Isaiah. Isaiah says the opposite in Isaiah 2, 4. He shall judge between the nations and shall arbitrate for many peoples. They shall beat their swords into plowshares and their spears into pruning hooks. Nations shall not lift up sword against nation, neither shall they learn war anymore. Why is it different? I don't know exactly. God does. Now we know Isaiah was probably written before Joel. And when I think about this and why it's a different type of a message, I'm reminded of one of my favorite books of the Bible, Ecclesiastes. Where we're told in Ecclesiastes 3, 1 to 3, and then verse 8 to kind of give it context, for everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, and a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, and a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time for war, and a time for peace. And so I kind of like that the Bible has this part where God says, I don't want you to do anything. I'm going to take care of all this. Isaiah, I don't want you to go to battle. I just want you to go to work in the fields. And then you've got this part of Joel that says, actually, I want you to get involved in what we're about to do. But what we need to remember as they get involved is that at all points during this, God is in control. God's leading this charge. God is the general. He is the one calling all the shots, and he's doing it with his warriors. I love that Joel calls out, he says, Lord, bring down your warriors, O Lord, in verse 11. And you should know when he says warriors, this is serious business. The Hebrew word here is givor, and it means vigorous, hero, or elite troops. In other words, these are like the special forces of God. These are the best of the best that are coming down from God and he is going to come and he is going to resolve and he's going to take care of all this in the valley of Jehoshaphat. And a lot of people have tried to figure out where is this valley? A couple of different theories on this. You should know that that name, that word Jehoshaphat literally means Yahweh judges. So it's the valley of a place where God is going to judge and God is going to set everything right. 
Um, the valley of decision that you saw referenced a couple times is probably a reference to the exact same place, this valley where there's going to be some type of battle where God is going to come and he's going to defend his people and he's going to push back everyone who has been hurting his people. Um, what you should know about this is this valley of decision that's talked about. It is God's decision, not ours. That whole judgment piece, it's not our job. God is the only one who gets to decide who has wronged him and who has not. He's given us his word to know what it looks like when we do that. But the judge is him, not us. We're in the valley of Yahweh judges. Not in the valley of Scott judges. We're not in the valley of you judges. We're not in the valley of anybody else judges. We're in the valley of where God only judges. Now, some people think this is a literal valley. Uh, they think it might be the Kidron Valley, uh, which is just east of Jerusalem. Here's a picture of what that looks like. Some think it was a very literal place, very close to Jerusalem. Some think it's just this proverbial idea, and it's not an actual physical place. It's a place wherever God comes down, when he comes down at the end to fix all of this, it's that place where God, Yahweh again, is going to judge. But the thing I want us to take away from this is to remember that God is on it. That thing that you wish was over, that struggle that you have that you can't fix, God's on it. That promise that you're holding on to, but you haven't quite seen it yet because you're not at the end of the hike, you're not at the end of the journey, you're not at the end of the problem, God's on it. There's a trail blazed before you, before me, there's a spirit, if we believe in Jesus Christ, that we can have as a guide on that trail. Just remember that God is on it. And if he does it tomorrow, great. If he does it years from now, great. He's on it and we can trust him and live into that future with hope. Now what do we do in the meantime? As we wait, as we march forward, as we take step after step, just trying to get to the end of that trail, that journey, the Bible says in 16, verse 16, the Lord is a refuge for his people. We get to take refuge in him as you wait. One of the most beautiful, I think, images of God, particularly in the Old Testament, is God who is a covering. The, think about the wings of God. All these pictures of this refuge of God that literally, like, he's over the top of us. He's protecting us. There is a reason, by the way, that many churches are designed in such a way that they come to a point. There's a steeple. They're pointing up. There's a covering and a reminder that there is a God over the top of us watching all of us. And so we're told here, even if we can't see it, we know the end's out there somewhere. He's with us. He's protecting us. He's watching over for us. And I love this image that Joel uses as he closes out Joel 3. Verse 18 says, In that day, the mountains shall drip sweet wine, the hills shall flow with milk, and all the stream beds of Judah shall flow with water. A fountain shall come forth from the house of the Lord and water the Wadi Shittim. Listen for his water. Listen for the work of God in the world. Listen for it. Look for it. Where do we already see God at work? I'm going to give you an illustration of this. We're going to go back to the, the hiking image. How many of you guys have hiked Eklutna Lake up in Alaska? Anybody else? Am I the only idiot? Yep. Okay. So I went up to Alaska for a week, and I had not been. I went up in uh, August, which is a fantastic time to go up there, and uh, would work all day, and then about 5, 5.30, I would take off, I would go home, I would change, and I would hike until basically 2, 2.30 in the morning, would go home, sleep four hours, and get up and do it again. Five days, came home completely sick. I have no idea how this happened. <laughs> so I go up there, and I got all these references and referrals for places to hike, right, from all these people who lived up there, because I had never been, right? And so they tell me about this hike. This is a Klutna Lake, and I actually took this picture, and they said there's this beautiful lake that you should hike to, they gave me the approximate distance, remember, because that's all I want to know. I just want to know how far I'm going to go. So I do this hike. Now, before you hear the rest of the story, I want you to see what a Klutna Lake normally looks like. Notice the blue skies, not a lot of clouds, and that even a dog can do it, okay? So I'm thinking, 
this, what could possibly happen, right? So I take off on my own, and I get to this point in the hike. Uh, this beautiful picture of the lake kind of looks a little ghosty because the clouds are starting to settle in. And at this point, it's about 10 or 10.30 at night, but because of the daylight thing, I can still see pretty well. And what I used to do is I would hike up and up and up, and because I can go downhill faster, I would run all the way down, finish about 2, 2.30, go home, go to bed. All right, so I get to this point, and I think, all right, there's some clouds, but they're up there. I don't need to worry about the clouds. This is cool. I'm going to keep going. So I did. And I look up, and I see that the clouds seem to be kind of hung up at the top of the mountains. I don't plan to go up to the tippy top, so I figure I'm good. I'll still be able to see until all of a sudden I start to notice that the clouds did this crazy thing and started to come down. And as they came down, I, of course, was going up, right? And so I'm looking, and I'm like, huh. Seem to be getting a little bit closer. I can see there's a little bit of water here, and that's usually a good sign for me. And so I'm like, I'm going to keep going. There's a trail here, and I'm sure I'll be able to just turn around at some point. And then this starts to happen. So that thing that I saw that was a stream becomes completely covered at the bottom and the top by clouds, and I find myself here. Can you see the trail? It's that little guy right there. Right? It's about, you know, 30. 60 feet out, and then I got clouds, then this happens. So at this point, I do not know where I am. I'm literally on the top, I'm not the tippy top of a mountain, but I'm on top of a section where I can no longer see the trail, and I am no longer walking straight. I have never in my life been this stressed out on a hike. Did I mention no one came with me? I told you my program, I, I didn't see a trail guide before I did this. And now, I can't see very far. And so there's a little bit, and I'm not much on panic and fear, you guys know this about me, but there's something going on inside of me. I was like, we've got a problem. I don't even know that anyone knows I'm here right now. And it's about midnight. So I'm sitting there and I'm trying to figure out what to do, and of course I don't stop, I just keep walking. And I'm like, at some point, I'm sure I'll get some sign that there's a trail and I can get back down. And that's when I heard it. Water. It was the most glorious sound I had ever heard. One of my favorite things about water is what does water do when it's on something solid? It goes down. And so I'm like, sweet, if there's water, it's going down, so I'm going down. And I remember, I ran. I ran towards the water. I ran down. And I remember the moment I saw it. I was like, yes. Like, I might have just been singing, like, hallelujah. All out there, all by myself, all alone, because I was able to finally glimpse this thing that was going to get me all the way down. It's one of my favorite things about hiking around water. You almost can never get lost. You can hear it. You can go for it. You know which direction it's going. It's going down. And so I just followed the water all the way down, and fortunately, it got me right back on the trail because God is good, and he was watching over me even when I was panicking, and I got all the way back to the car. Listen for his water. Rather than panic, even when we don't know where we're going, even when we don't know when he's going to fix it, listen for his water. These trails, these things he's marked in the world where we can get to see what he's already done in the world, what he's maybe doing in the life of someone else. And as we take communion, remember that he has already laid it all out. He has already proven who he is and what he's done for us and how much he loves us. And so when you take communion, my hope and prayer is we just drink from the overflowing cup of who God is as he pours into us and pours into the world around us. Let's pray and then you can take communion. Father God, we thank you that you've gone ahead of us. We thank you that we're all walking a trail that you've blazed. We thank you for the instructions you've given us, the trail map and your word. We thank you for the spirit as our guide. And we thank you that in moments when we can't do it, when we're concerned or confused, but we know you've told us there's a future and hope and you're going to come and restore all this, we can look to what you've already done and is more than enough. You sent your son to come to this earth and show us what it looks like to live perfectly. And then he gave up that perfect life for us. 
And he said, do this in remembrance of me. I gave my life for you and for all, for once and forever. And so as we take the bread, I pray that we'll remember the body of Christ broken for us forever. As we take that cup of juice, remember the blood of Christ poured out for us and for everyone forever. So we can be with you forever. And I pray that fills us with a hope that we can live right into. It's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.